let's start with these uh, with these questions now. Okay. Okay. Question number one. This is the easy one. What is your full name, and why were you named it? Carl Wilhelm Christensen. I don't know why I got my middle name Wilhelm from. I remember one time when when I was in school, in grade school, it was at the beginning of uh, World War One, or just before the beginning. I think it was around 1914, and uh, uh, and. The hated uh, person in the world was Kaiser Wilhelm, and I came home from school one time, and I got after my mother, and I asked her why on earth they called me Wilhelm. I didn't like it, and I didn't like the name, and I thought they ought to change it, and so they convinced me that it was a very good name, but it was the Danish name for William. So I was mollified, and after that, I always wrote Carl W. I never wrote Wilhelm. Mm -hmm. But now I don't care whether it's, it's W or Wilhelm. But I still am so used to writing W. I keep on doing it. <clears throat> but I remember during that period when I was in grade school, I was quite offended to think that I would had the same name as Kaiser Bill. <laughs> Do you have any uh, Do you have any nicknames now, or did you have any nicknames while you were growing up? Yeah, I was known <clears throat> when I was youngster. I was always known as Christy. Mm -hmm. It was just a short name, shortened name for the first part of my last name, and and I I kept on having that name until I moved from Chicago, and then I decided that. I didn't care for that name. I'd rather be called Carl by my regular name, Carl. Mm -hmm. So back in New England, I'm known as Carl. And now that you're on the internet, you're known as Christy again. Well, I use uh, I, I use my email number, Christic, mm -hmm. and the reason I do that is because the friends I used to have when I worked at Armour and Company, they always knew me as Christy, and I figured. If they'd see my email with a C after it, they know who it is. Yeah. It's just a made up name. Did you have any siblings growing up? Any brothers or sisters that you did have? I have, brothers I have three sisters left. Mm -hmm. I, our family consisted of six. I had four sisters and one brother. And, uh, my oldest sister died at the age of 12, and she died back in 1916. Mm. And <clears throat> apparently it was uh, inflammation, some inflammation and infection she had. <clears throat> and those days they didn't have antibiotics or anything like that, so she didn't have much chance. She just passed, just faded away and finally died. It was my sister Anna. Mm -hmm. and then my youngest sister, when she was born, they gave her the same name. And she's always resented it because she thought that that uh, she, she didn't like the idea of being named for another person. I told her that it was a European custom Usually when children are born, they were never, never named for a living person. They were always named for a dead person, some person who was very dear to the family. And I, and my folks always figured that it was a compliment to her to be able to be named after an older sister. But she didn't see it the same way. But she didn't see it that way. But I think I, I think I convinced her, I told her. So she hadn't realized that it was a custom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question is, where were you born and when were you born? I was born in Highland Park on August 22nd, 1903. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how long did you, did you stay there? Oh, I think we lived there about uh, uh, less than a year. And then my mother got very homesick and she wanted to go back to Denmark, so Dad took took 
is took my mother and, and I, and we returned to Denmark, and we were over there about oh less than a year. And during that time, I had a, my sister, oldest sister Anna, was born, mm -hmm. and she was born in 1904, January 12, 1904. And then when she was less than a year old, we came back to the United States. And uh, my mother wanted to stop uh, on, well, they were, actually they thought they were going to Chicago, but they stopped off at Cory, Pennsylvania to visit her sister who lived there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, while they were there, Dad went to work for Howard Tannery, and uh, they stayed in Cory a couple years and until then in 1907, they went to Spring Creek, Pennsylvania, and Dad was superintendent of the Beck Tanning Company there, hmm. which this J.W. and A.P. Howard had just acquired. And so he, he was there, and he was from 1907 until about 1923, and then he, the tannery closed down, and then he went to Cory, Pennsylvania. And they lived, they lived in Cory, in a great big house, company house, and uh, they lived there until, they lived there for seven or eight years. And then my dad bought a, sm uh, a small farm out in Columbus, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, and they moved out there on a farm. And uh, they, lived, they lived on this, in this farmhouse for, oh, until about, 19. How old were you at the time that you moved into that house? Into that house? Yeah. Um, I was 33 years old. 33? Yeah. And then we still have a lot of family in Cory, don't we? Oh, yes. That area. Yeah. In fact, uh, most of most of my family lives in in uh, in the area around Cory, Pennsylvania. I think some of the family, oh yeah, and I have m many cousins living around the Erie, Erie area, and then of course they're scattered all over the country now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the total number in the family is around three or four, about 300, the Christensen family. And then uh, my wife's family, Ruth, her family, they, they number about 350, and they're all in in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania and the uh, western part of New York. Where was it that um, that you lived when you first became or started inventing? When you first became an inventor? Here. Oh, inventor. Yes. Oh, I uh, when I went to Chicago, got transferred okay. to Chicago and worked for the research of Armour and Company. Then I started working on fatty acids and organic derivatives from there. And while I was doing that, this this work became fairly important because it was the beginning of a new series of chemicals that were being made. And while, I, while we were doing that, why I was, uh, they took they took portions of my work and they took, and, and they invent, and they, published and got an, an invention on it so that it would be protected mm -hmm. against other people that were working in the f same field. And so I had a series of about, oh, maybe 30 or 40 patents there, and they were ranging from uh, new products to new methods of making products. Mm -hmm. And then after I left, uh, I left, then when I was retired from that company, then I went with Shipley Companies, which was uh, uh, in the field of electronics, mm -hmm. and they made photoresists, which was part of the, of the chemicals which were used, chemical coatings which were used for printed circuits and semiconductors. And while I was working there, part, portions of my work became patents there, and I had a whole series of patents. And, some of them were over in Europe, especially in France mm -hmm. and Italy and the different foreign countries. So I have uh, 
a whole string of patents there. I probably had about 50 inventions altogether. Mm -hmm. My name, e either I'm a, a total inventor or the lone inventor or a, a co-inventor. Co mm -hmm. Usually we work in teams of two. Yeah. And uh, so many of my patents are, are shared with another person. What was the best or the greatest thing, in your opinion, that you've ever invented? What is? Yeah. Well, it was pretty hard because they were all interrelated. <laughs> oh. Well, um, my mom told me that you actually, you ended up in inventing or working on some chemicals that later sort of set the foundation for the whole computer, the personal well, computer business. <clears throat> when I own. first went to Shipley's, they had a photo resist. Mm -hmm. And they weren't completely satisfied with it because when they when they put used the coating, they couldn't control the thickness. In the meantime, I found I found a, a series of chemicals which did do this, and so I checked out all of those, and I finally found a combination of uh, uh, polymers which which were both soluble and which didn't interfere with the photographic qualities. Mm -hmm. And so it made the, made the photo resist and from then on they didn't have much trouble with it. It, it improved it. And then, and then the further inventions were uh, uh, further changes in the formulas so as to make it more effective. But there was a series of them and what but they, couldn't, they were really protection so that they could operate for 17 years without, you know, before anybody, if anybody infringed, then they had, then they had, then they were allowed to sue and, mm -hmm. and collect damages. Okay. This, um, this next question is back about your high school, about when you were a little kid. And it is, um, were, were there any chores? that you had to do when you were a kid that you just hated oh, yes. to do? Oh, yes, I did many chores. Yeah. And uh, I protested against some of them like all kids do. But I used to have to milk a cow. Mm -hmm. Every night I had to go and get a cow out of the pasture and bring it into the barn and, and then milk it. And then uh, uh, and the next morning, uh, then I had to get up early I had to get up at six o'clock, and I had to milk this cow before I went to school. And uh, lots of times I used to be sort of uh, think that I was punished for something <laughs> yeah. that I had done. And but I did it, and uh, and I and I I think I did a fairly good job. Yeah. All through high school, I. I had to get up in the morning and go and milk the cow and then go home and get breakfast and then get cleaned up and then I had to take a train to Cory, Pennsylvania, which was seven miles away, went to the high school there and then at night why we came back on the seven o'clock train. Seven o'clock? Yeah, seven at night. Oh. And the train came through. We went to school about nine o'clock in the morning. And the train was always, it was, uh, it was the, uh, what they call the P&E, mm -hmm. Philadelphia and Erie portion of the Pennsylvania Railroad. So you and had to take the train every morning yeah. and then every night? How long was the train ride to get to school? Seven miles. Seven miles. Yeah. And um, what, did it drop you off at nearby your school? No, we dropped it off the train station, then we had to walk to school, which was about three blocks away. Mm -hmm. And what was the school like at that time? Corey High School. Yeah. Big school? Uh, I guess about 400 pupils were enrolled in it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, think, I think when our class started, there were about 100, it was about 100 students. Then we had many dropouts, and 33 graduated mm -hmm. in 1921. Only 33. Only 33 out of the bunch. And uh, I went back to my 75th uh, anniversary, and I found out that I was the oldest, 
the oldest graduate of Corey High School, and I was uh, shared the honor with one other person of being the only one that was living out of the early, early, I think the classes around 1920, 21, 22, and 23, and I was the oldest one. And now I think I'm the only survivor. I'm the, I'm the oldest, the oldest graduate and the only survivor in the early classes, 1921. Mm -hmm. Then I went so. to Penn State and enrolled in a course of chemical engineering. And was that on? How did you? How did you happen upon chemical engineering? Was well, this something that you had always wanted to do? I had always wanted to go into chemistry, and and uh, when I got there, they had uh, they had two fields street chemists and uh, industrial chemists, and I chose industrial chemistry, and then in the second year the school changed the name to chemi chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. and, um, so back, did, um, when, while you were at the, at the high school there in Cory? Well, yeah, and uh, I would when I when I graduated, I was the valedictorian of the class. Really? And uh, yes, and uh, I went through the usual procedure. <laughs> and uh, but I earned a scholarship of three hundred dollars to Allegheny College. But in the meantime, I didn't want to go to a liberal arts school. I wanted to go to chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. So I went to Penn State. A at that time, it was known as Pennsylvania State College. After I graduated, the school became a university. But I, when I was there, it was, and uh, the, the, there was always uh, quite a hassle in the school because uh, the school of engineering was growing bigger and bigger each year, and they had to have more and more money from the state legislature. Mm -hmm. which up to that time always gave the bulk of the monies to the School of Agriculture because that's what it was originally set up for. When Penn State started back in 1940 or, yeah, about 19, no, 1840, it was known as a farmer's high school. And then it gradually grew and grew and then became Penn State College and included the mechanical arts and sciences. Up until that time it had been a school of agriculture and liberal arts. Mm -hmm. And then they finally added the engineering and they became very good at it. And now, now engineering is the largest school in the schools. And since then, Penn State has established another branch down in uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania, and that's the School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And it's a very good school, from what I hear. Um, while you were in high school, did you have any favorite classes? Yes, I liked uh, mathematics, history, and uh, and uh, chemistry. And I was more intrigued with chemistry than I was with the others. Mm -hmm. Were there any classes that you didn't like? Well, uh, I... Yeah. Not really. I think... Uh, I think probably I had more difficulty in, in, in taking Latin. I took two years of Latin, mm -hmm. and uh, at the time they banned they banned Germ German because we were at war with Germany. And, uh, and then when I went to the to Penn State, uh, I took uh, German. I had to take German because uh, all the chemical engineers had to take uh, two years of scientific German mm -hmm. and and I and of all the courses that I had at Penn State I seemed to have more trouble with the German than I did with anything else mathematics and chemistry were, were very easy mm. were, um, were, was school easy for you mm -hmm. was school easy for you while you were there did you find that yeah. you had an easy time oh, yeah, I know. Oh, I, I had to put in good time for studying. In the meantime, 
I work I work for my room for my board. Mm -hmm. I work for my meals. I worked in a in a, uh, a cafeteria. The uh, not it wasn't a cafeteria. It was a dining room for a girls girls section. And so I used to help with the dishes and and one time I I was uh, uh, Oh, what the heck do they call them? Flunk we call them flunkies, but that wasn't their official name. <laughs> flunkies. <laughs> yeah, I had to do everything for the sh for the chef, mm -hmm. like carrying uh, big big bowls of soup. And, yeah. And uh, like a like a bus boy. Yeah, that's really what it was. I was a only I was in the kitchen. I didn't have to work with a dishes, collecting dishes, mm -hmm. it had to do with helping the chef. Yeah. And uh, he had uh, he had two people helping him. One was, we always called him number one boy and then number two boy. I was always number two boy. <laughs> because I came after the number one boy was working. Yeah. <laughs> he was a French chef and he had a big long cigarette holder, about 20 inches long. and, and uh, and he didn't talk very good English, and he'd point that thing at where I was supposed to go, and then follow me. So he trot off to the big pantry, and I'd drag it right after him. Of course, I had to do all the work. I had to carry all the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but we got along fine. Yeah, that's good. Uh, did you have a, when you were growing up? Did your friends and you have a special hangout, like a diner or? A no, we someone's house or a uh, favorite thing was to go down to the railroad station and watch the trains come in. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'd go to the general store and hang around there and, and then uh uh they'd get sick of us and chase us out and then we'd go down to the barber shop and hang around there and then go home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unusual usual kids hang out. Yeah. yeah, just outside. Did you um? Did you play any sports during school? I played baseball mostly, mm -hmm. but uh, in the winter we played uh, uh, our kids' versions of hockey and, and different. And we used used to used to do a lot of skating uh, and. Uh, and we used to do a lot of coasting. We had bobsleds, and we had we had two places to slide. One was forbidden, and the other was not. And we usually went to the forbidden one because it was more fun. <laughs> Always are. <laughs> well, um, there was one obstacle that was pretty bad in those days. See, the farmers came to town to get feed and groceries, and. Um, <clears throat> They bring their grains in to be ground, and then they come back with the ground grains. And their horses would be drawing, drawing a wagon in, in the summer, and in the winter it was a sleigh. So the danger was was to not not go down the hill while the sleigh was coming up or going down. Mm -hmm. And what what did you usually wear to school when you went? Was there a dress code at your high school? No, when when I was a kid, up until the time you were thirteen or fourteen, you always wore knee pants and long stockings, mm -hmm. <laughs> knicker knickers, knickers. Yeah, you wore knickers and and long stockings. Mm -hmm. and then when you got to be thirteen or fourteen, you got long pants, and then you were then you were really king. Yeah. Do you remember any fads during your youth? Any um, fads where people would wear clothing that no, was the, different. The, the only fad I know of that they wore was sweaters. Mm -hmm. All kinds of sweaters. They didn't have sweatshirts. No one wore t-shirts or sweatshirts because I don't think they were invented. Hmm. Uh, the only the only thing resembling a sweatshirt was was a heavy underwear. Yeah. <laughs> and they were usually buttoned down the front. Yeah. Did you have any, um, do you remember the names of your best friends from when you were younger? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, sure. I remember all the names of them. Yeah. yeah Bob Donaldson, Art Grady, Ted Stearns, Edgar McCrane, and Art Brundage, mm -hmm. Milton Crane, Ferdinand Johnson. Incidentally, Ferdinand Johnson turned out to be a famous cartoonist. He was he was assistant to the guy that drew uh, Moon, Mullins. Moon Mullins. And then on Moon Mullins' death, well, then he carried it for a couple of years for the Chicago Tribune. Mm -hmm. And then when he retired, he went out to California and started his own strip. Yeah. And then, then he finally retired, and his son is doing it now. Really? Did you hear anything? Um did you hear anything else about uh, how your friends turned out? Oh, um, yeah, they, they all seemed to turn out pretty well. They, some of them went in, Ted Stearns went into an auto repair business, and I guess he finally owned, owned and ran a garage in Warren, Pennsylvania. And Art Grady turned into a, uh, one of the top salesmen for uh, some big candy company. And he was very good at selling. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob Donaldson became a doctor, and his he was a doctor in Kane, Pennsylvania, and then finally in Warren, Pennsylvania. And uh, and some of the other persons, I never did find out what happened to them. But uh, and uh, a lot of my high school people, they went into business with their with their fathers, and, and they all were successful business people. Do you remember your first date ever? Yeah. Well, we had many where you walk somebody home from a party or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you can call them dates or not. But uh, the first, the first real date I ever had was when I met your grandmother, and then uh, for some reason or other I sort of really fell for her in a big way, yeah. and I thought she was extra special. And uh, I don't think we, I think we went to a movie on the first date. Yeah. And then after that, I, we used to just uh, take a walk or do a lot of talking and I don't know, it just seemed that we were interested in each other. I really don't remember much about it, to tell you the truth. Do you remember what movie it was? Huh? Do you remember what movie you watched? No, I don't know. I probably didn't pay much attention to the movie. Yeah. <laughs> probably, <looked like that. laughs> probably paying all the attention to Mimi. And then, so you guys, you met, you went to the movie. How did you ask her? Do you remember? Gee, I don't know. I, I, uh, I, I was home on a Christmas vacation, and I, uh, and uh, I was very tired. And the kids came around, and they wanted to go on a sleigh ride. And so I finally agreed to go to sleigh ride. And they landed up at a country dance out in West Spring Creek, and. Uh, when we went in there, I wasn't much interested in anything going on. I was just there, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, I happened to see a sort of a pretty-looking girl that sort of uh, <laughs> I took a liking to, and I made it a point to go over and talk to her. Yeah. And uh, from then on, I, we got glued together. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, so the, as soon as I had a chance, I, 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 I went to see. What, see her and see if she was still okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then after that I didn't notice other girls. I just I just had eyes for her. Mm -hmm. And how long did you um how long did you date for before you asked her to um, marry you? Oh, let's see, I I went with her from about nineteen twenty four until 1929, and then I decided we ought to get married. Mm -hmm. So you decided, I want to marry this girl. How did no, you ask her? I decided, well, we both sort of mutually agreed to it. Oh. But I decided it was about time. Mm -hmm. So in 1929, we got married in Dunkirk, New York. 
and uh, then uh, I, I was working for Armour and Company, and and uh, the company was supposed to curtail some of its actions, some of its activities because of the anti Sherman antitrust laws, mm -hmm. and so I started looking around for a job, and and uh, one of, and the person I worked for over there says, well. He says it's a shame to waste all that time you've been working for Armour and Company. Why don't I, why don't, why don't I get in touch with, with some people in Chicago and find out if, if they need a chemist. So I got in touch and I went out and had an interview and they hired me. So I, we went, moved to Chicago. So Ruth and I we went on the train to Chicago and on. Uh, October 28th, 1929, that was the day the stock market, the big crash in the stock market. Mm -hmm. When we arrived in Chicago, I wondered what all the fuss was about, but I went to work out at Armour's and, and uh, we, we, we rented a place out on, on the south side of Chicago and uh, we lived there until 1932. Then Craig was born, so we moved to West Marquette Road out in Chicago, mm -hmm. and we were there until he was about uh, he was about uh, seven, in the eighth grade, I guess, about 1939. No, he it was less than that. Let's see, it was 1932. Yeah, 1940. Then we went out to Hinsdale, Illinois, and then he he went to uh, grade school, mm -hmm. and then into high school. Then he graduated in 1949, mm -hmm. and then uh, he went to he went down to the University of Illinois and went there for four years. At the end of that time, he was drafted, and but in the meantime, he had he had gotten. Uh, he had applied for for uh, graduate study at Cornell University, mm -hmm. and uh, then he got drafted. Well, anyhow, I I told him that if he went and served his time in the draft, and he could get in earlier than the date they picked for him, that he'd finish quicker, and then he could go to school. And I said it was, and and I said not only that, but then he'd have. He would come under the GI Bill for education, and I said, and here I I agreed to put him through school before, but I figured as long as long as he went to the army, let the army pay it, mm -hmm. and and then not only that, but he get a lot of experience, so he went to a boot camp or or training camp. He was in the infantry, but they didn't like to have him in the infantry because. In the first place, he was too tall. Second place, he was left-handed, and the bullets came out on the wrong side of the gun for him. <laughs> and so they they wanted to put him in a tank school. And I told him, no, don't don't go for tanks. That's 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 too dangerous. Yeah. So he had a choice of radio school or chemical warfare, and I told him skip the chemical warfare and get into radio. Yeah. I figured it had more possibilities than the other. Yeah. So he got into communications and radio work. So he went to Camp Gordon for his training, and then from there they shoved him out to to uh, Washington, D.C. No, Washington, state of Washington, Seattle, mm -hmm. and uh, then from that was, I think that was Camp Lewis. And uh, that was really the jumping off place to go to Korea. Well, anyhow, they when they found out that his time was shortened by going in the army, <laughs> they figured, oh, there's no use sending him over to over there and then have him leave the army. Yeah. So they sent him down to Fort Huachuca with a signal corps. And so when he got down there. They discovered that he was the smartest guy that they had, so they put him in charge of communications, mm -hmm. and he had to 
he had to edit the uh, news about uh, news of the country and the world and everything. And he was, and, and then they discovered that he was a good bowler. And so, and also he was a good golfer. So the officers wanted a good guy to play with. So, so, so they, he got out of a, a lot of KP and a lot of crappy stuff. You know that all of them go through. So he was sort of so. So I would get instructions, ship him the golf clubs, and his bowling ball, and you know I, I told him for Christ's sake, he's not in the army. He's in a country club. <laughs> well, anyhow, <laughs> then he finished his hitch in the in the army, and then he headed for Cornell, mm -hmm. and then he enrolled. I guess he came a little bit late, but he was still eligible. So he, so, so he went to Cornell, and then the, of course the army paid paid the bill, GI Bill. They paid for all his books and room and board and all that stuff, expenses. Mm -hmm. So he did all right. Mm -hmm. So he graduated as a chemical engineer, got a PhD in it, and he wrote a thesis that nobody can understand but him and the professor that wrote it. <laughs> So how old was Craig when my mom was born? What? How old was Craig when, when Karen was born? My mom. Um, let's see, he was 1932. He was 11 years old. There's a difference of 11 years between them. Wow. That's a big gap. And uh, So really, by the time that they were just getting used to each other, Craig went off to... Yeah. Went off to the army. Yeah. yeah. So he's always been a. Um, they weren't very close because of that. But mm -hmm. when she was little, he just adored her. He used to teach her big words. And of course, she, she, and a lot of those words were very funny. For instance, a, a cement mixer was a cementer, and uh, she couldn't say community house. And she couldn't say kidney beans, and so she said she wanted to go down to the community house and eat kidney beans. <laughs> she had a lot of little <laughs> pet expressions, and then uh, Craig would always tell her that she was illiterate because she couldn't read. And of course, and then one time we were at the spinning wheel, and it was a real nice restaurant. She was sitting in her high chair, and. Uh, and uh, so when the girl came around and gave us menus, she very playfully gave a menu to my, to Karen. And Karen says, I'm illiterate. <laughs> and she'd hold this thing up. And of course, <laughs> the girl just about fell over. <laughs> no kid had ever told her that before. <laughs> and then she was always talking about when she grew up, she was going to Latin school. <laughs> it was real funny. Yeah. But when she was real little and sitting in the high chair, she'd eat, she'd eat, and then if you weren't watching her, she'd put the plate on top of her head, dump everything on top of her head, and <laughs> rub it in, you know. <laughs> we, used to have, we used to have to watch her pretty close. <laughs> she, she was a little dickens. <laughs> yeah, she was very funny. And then I, I take it she grew out of that at some point. Oh, yeah. yeah. She got to be quite a lady, young lady. Okay. Just looking for a good question. Uh, do you remember anything that um, that either Craig or Karen did when they were much younger that really that amazed you? Really what? That really amazed you, that you just couldn't believe? And... Yeah, I used to be quite surprised when uh, Karen was doing algebra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, she never seemed to do it the way it ought to be done, but always came up with the right answer. That sort of surprised me all. Really? <laughs> I never could figure that out. <laughs> she took a shortcut. Oh, here's a good one. Describe your wedding ceremony. What was that like? Were there a lot of people there? No, there was only, uh, I think there were only four. No, five people there. Only five people? Yeah, 
Well, you see, we um, we got married over a weekend. Many, and I, I don't just understand the reason for it, but uh, we it was uh, your aunt Hazel mm -hmm. Lindgren was one, and uh, let's see, what the heck was her name? Edna. Edna Mitchell was another, and then there was a preacher's wife, and then of course the preacher, and then me, and then, and then Ruth. So and, uh, I really don't remember too much about it. All I know is we got married. You got married over a weekend, so you decided on Friday. Yeah, we decided. And then you just got married well, on, on Sunday. Yeah, when, well, we decided there was no use putting on a big fuss over it. We might yeah. well just get married, and it was just you know like that. Mm -hmm. And and of course I had to be back at work on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and Mom she she had to go get back home for something I don't know what. And when uh, when she told her mother she was married, uh, her mother was quite disappointed because you didn't get have a chance to put on a wedding, you know, and mm -hmm. have all the people there. And we decided it was much better this way. Yeah. Did you have um? Where did you go for your honeymoon? Did you have a honeymoon? Yeah, I really don't remember. I don't think we had enough money for a honeymoon. Huh? I think we stayed over in Dunkirk. Do you remember the first job that you ever had? Not, not summer vacation jobs. No? You didn't have summer vacation jobs? Yeah. Or, I, oh, you did? I always worked in a tannery. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, I was... I think I think I was over the legal age of 16 or whatever, but you had to follow the child labor laws, you know. And I <clears throat> I did different jobs. I used to be a tally boy. I used to weigh the kites and leather and stuff, and finish incoming products and outgoing products. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, and then I did a lot of flunky work, and then and then lots of times. Uh, when when the when the work like that ran out, well then I'd have to tally up the sheets and total the weights, and uh, it was pretty good practice because I learned how to add mm -hmm. rather fast, and it'd be columns about twenty or thirty in a column, and I'd total up the the weights and then they'd check it against the sheets of their invoice sheets and see if they got the right weight. Mm -hmm. And then from there you went off to college and you worked in the woman's Yeah, uh, and then, the I, and store then store. on one vacation I worked in Warren Axe and Tool, grinding mm -hmm. grinding axes and and uh, and what P V hooks and I don't know what all everything had to do with lumbering. But it was it was interesting work. When you were growing up can you remember before you wanted, before you decided that you wanted to be an engineer or a chemist? Oh yeah, when, what, was, what did you want to be? Oh, when before? I was in grade school, every I I either wanted to be a, a, a railroad engineer. I always thought that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. He'd dash out of his cab and oil up the wheels, and I thought that would yeah it looked real important. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then. And then if I saw a fireman, then I wanted to be a fireman. If I saw a parade or anything, then I wanted to be a general. Or mm -hmm. I, Like most kids, you're changeable. When you first graduated college and, um, and you started working, was it difficult to make enough money to survive or to live comfortably at that time? Well... You couldn't throw money around. No, I I didn't have any trouble getting along. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't save much because I didn't make much. <laughs> but back in those days, salaries weren't very high. You were just lucky to have a job because uh, it was uh, it wasn't it wasn't quite depression, but it was close to it. Close and to prices before were, or after the depression. Well, prices were very high compared to the salaries you got. Mm -hmm. 
so you really couldn't you couldn't spend money for anything you wanted but you if you watched your if you watched your outgo you you could pretty well judge how many uh, when you were working the summer job at the tannery I'm just curious how much time did you work there how many hours did you spend a week working um, well, back in those days, they they worked uh, ten hours a day, mm -hmm. and uh, then on Saturday afternoons, you you uh, Saturday afternoons, if you had been there every day, then that you got the afternoon off, mm -hmm. working five and a half days a week, and ten hour days. And ten hour days, and then five hours on Saturday, so it was fifty five hours. Wow. And then back in uh, nineteen nineteen twenty four, they changed over to the eight hour day, and the only reason they did that was because practically everybody and his brother were going out to Detroit. Mm -hmm. Henry Ford used to pay five dollars five dollars an hour, and you worked only eight hours a day. You worked forty hours a week, mm -hmm. and five dollars an hour was awfully, awfully high because uh, that meant that you got forty bucks a day. Mm -hmm. And of course, time, all the little towns weren't paid; they weren't pay anywhere near that. How much did they pay at the tannery? Oh, uh, you were lucky to get. Uh, let's see what. The, I don't remember just exactly what it was. I think you bought 50, 54 hours. You were lucky to get $30 a week. For 54 hours? Yeah. So $5 an hour was incredible. Oh yeah, because a lot of people, they, they had never heard of such a thing, so they went out to Detroit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Henry Ford said that when he started building Fords on a large scale. And of course he got lots. He could take the cream of the crop because he could pick anybody he wanted to. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you retired? From everything? Yep. 74. <laughs>